Hi everyone, this is Jim. Welcome to this postmortem of my Blitz game number 918. And my opponent started off with d4 here. I went knight f6 and he went bishop to g5. You can see that's the uh, third choice here in the opening database after uh, c4 and knight f3. It's called the Trumpkovs Trumpovsky attack and a pretty interesting way to play. Um, you know, one little trick to remember is you always have this knight e4 move when your knight is not pinned there and the bishop comes out to g5. And it's often a good idea. You should at least think about this move. And now he played uh, bishop to h4. Um, the main move here is bishop f4. And uh, as I mentioned in the game, uh, c5 is a way to play. But here I would probably still just play with uh, d5 and hope to get some kind of normal position. f3 can lead to crazy complications. But here you can play with, uh, with c5 or you can just keep developing bishop f5. Anyway, should should lead to some kind of normal position, playable position for black. Um, but he went with bishop h4, the second choice, and I went with d5, um, just to show some of the complications in the c5 line. And there are similar things going on in the other line if the bishop is on f4. He can play f3 here and kick the knight, and, uh, and you can play g5 kicking his bishop. So the knight's supporting this pawn on g5. His, knights, his pawn's attacking your knight, your pawn's attacking his bishop, and, uh, and there's also a potential trade going on here. Anyway, it's just a crazy kind of position, and uh, I prefer to avoid it, but, uh, but actually um, black equalizes in this line. So if you want to become an expert in how to play against the Trumpovsky, you should probably uh, study some line like this, but mainly I just try to get to a position that I can play. So after he goes bishop h4, I just go with d5 in either case, whether the bishop went to f4 or to h4. And then um, he can kick with f3. And then here's a, an idea for you. You drop the knight back to d6 instead of going to f6. And then he continues to develop. You can bring your knight out to f5, hitting the bishop and hitting the pawn. And he has to drop his bishop back. And your knight's in a bit of a funny space, but uh, it's your turn at that point. You can develop and uh, seems like uh, it's an okay position for black. So anyway, that's just a little bit about how you might play if he goes for that f3 line. He went with knight d2, which uh, I wasn't so sure about. I mean, he's offering the trade, but I don't know why he wants to trade. He just seems to like to trade. So, well, this is, this is my first point in the game. I guess I can comment on it. There are several times where he offers trades. And uh, most cases, I think it's a bad idea for him to offer these trades. First of all, he has the white pieces, and so I think he should be playing for a win. So why should he offer a trade that doesn't uh, bring any benefit to him? Um, so he goes knight d2. If I take, maybe it'll bring his queen forward. So maybe there's a slight edge, but I don't have to take. I just uh, develop my bishop, and then he takes my knight, and we're just out of the book. So he's just going for the trade for the sake of trading, and I think that's a bad idea, right? I think you should trade... Uh, you should not be afraid of trading. You should trade whenever uh, whenever you think you can get an advantage uh, or if you need to get out of trouble <laughs> and you need to trade off some of your opponent's attacking pieces because you think you're going to get mated or lose material, uh, then it's okay to trade. But uh, just trading for the sake of trading is a bad idea. It just uh, reduces the game to a simpler position and uh, you know there's no reason to suspect that uh, you will be able to play that simpler position better than your opponent. I mean, if you're afraid of him in a complicated position, you should also be afraid of him in a simple position because you'll find that the experts and the masters are very good at playing these simple uh, technical positions and they can, they can squeeze wins out of very, very narrow margins. Um, so I just think uh, White's whole philosophy here is wrong. Um, let's see. But anyway, after knight takes e4, we're just out of the opening book. I, I take back naturally. He plays e3. I go g6. That's probably a bit of a mistake. I think after that, white has an advantage. Um, there's a number of other moves I could play. I, I looked at this with a chess engine. Uh, F6 is possible. Uh, you know, sometimes you worry about the queen coming out with a check, but you've already got a bishop here on this diagonal to come back and block. So the queen check is not going to be a problem. And that, that nicely shuts down this bishop, although it doesn't help with your development. Uh, playing with C6 or with knight D7 seem to be okay as well. G6, it's just a bit slow, and it also takes some squares away from this uh, light-squared bishop, which uh, maybe he could exploit with a move like f3. Kick my bishop around, and queen d2. This is a line 
a chest onion gives with a slight edge to white. But anyway, he, he did normal development here. I can't criticize that. Knight f3 on bishop g7. He goes knight d2. <clears throat> I will criticize that a bit. He, again, he's uh, offering a trade for no particular reason. In this case, I didn't want the trade. I decided I wanted to keep the bishop. And um, and also, I didn't want to you know end up with a doubled pawn here that he might attack. So I dropped the bishop back. And he played bishop d3 as if to uh, say, you know, we're going to trade whether you like it or not. And, uh, well, if your opponent keeps offering you trades, you should, uh, you know, if you want to avoid them and, and you have good moves, other squares for your piece, pieces, you can go ahead and avoid them. But if there's no uh, there's no good way to avoid the trade, um, you shouldn't back down. <laughs> you shouldn't just make a bad move because your opponent keeps offering trades. You should go ahead and take. And after this, um, black has already equalized. Uh, you know, white has some structural defects. He has maybe a slight edge in development with one extra piece out. But uh, overall, those two things compensate for each other, and it's a pretty equal position. Um, let's see. I should probably castle here. Knight d7, actually, although it seems logical to uh, develop at this point and bring the knight over to the king side here, where his pieces are. Uh, it has a slight weakness. He could have played queen to b3 here with a double attack. And I can defend it, but then my knight ends up over here on the queen side. So I don't lose material, but maybe it gives a little bit of uh, initiative to, to white to play that way. So if instead uh, of playing knight d7, if I had just castled here, um, there's no double attack, right? If the queen comes out to b3, this pawn is still defended by my queen. And I can just play uh, b6 or something. So uh, it was strictly because I played the move... Uh, knight to d7 that he had this opportunity for a moment here to play this double attack uh, and would have given him a little something but he didn't play that he castled i castled oh i didn't castle right away i played uh, c5 here that was the other idea with knight to d7 get that c5 move in um, he played knight f3 and now i castled and he took on c5 i took back and he went d4 and let's see, kick my knight. So I go to this good square with my knight, knight on e4, and he goes knight d2. So it's like the third time he's uh, offering a trade. And uh, and once again, I think it's a bad idea. Uh, why offer these trades when they don't uh, lead to anything? And this this uh, position is still just completely even. All he's doing is removing removing material from the board for no reason. Um, you know, you can, you can offer trades when you... Uh, well, like I said, if you think it brings you an advantage or if you think you need to because you're losing, but why offer a trade in an even position? It just makes no sense. Uh, and he had better moves. So, for example, he could have played queen a4. He could have played uh, knight to e1. If he just wanted to get the knight off of that square so he could push my knight away with f3, that makes sense. That's a plan. Uh, that, that would be an okay move, but uh, knight d2 makes no sense to me. Um, so I took it. I mean, like I said, don't be afraid of trades just because your opponent is offering them. <laughs> Sometimes those trades are good for you. In this case, it is. Knight takes, queen takes, or at least it does no harm, and I'm not going to uh, back down. So I go queen d7, unpinning my pawn and preparing e5. He goes queen b4, and I go e5, and uh, he goes rook a to d1. And after a couple of trades, I'm just better. So uh, so he's, he is, uh, after the exchange here, I'm better. Um, so what should he play? He should go ahead and take and give me this isolated queen's pawn and then play rook to d1. And that's just still about an even position. I have a little bit of activity here with the better bishop. And, um, and he has the isolated queen's pawn that he can play against in the long run. So that would be about even. Uh, but instead, he played the rook over here first. And this lets me get to a good position. This allows a pawn structure transformation that I can make by taking here. So this is an example of a trade that has a purpose <laughs> because uh, he has to take back with a pawn now. My bishop is on that square, so he does want to take with the rook or the queen. And this is a very interesting structure. It's called the ram structure. And um, it's pretty straightforward to analyze. Um, you look at who can control these files. You look at... Um, who has good minor pieces to take advantage 
of these outpost squares and you look at who has the better bishop. Now the minor pieces have all been traded off so uh, and both sides have equal access to the uh, to the, uh, the E file and the C file, so neither side has an advantage there. But I have the better minor piece because my bishop is attacking his pawn, whereas his bishop will have to play a uh, purely defensive role. So this gives me an edge uh, for the rest of the game. I have a slight edge, and that's strictly because of the way that, uh, that white played, allowing that uh, transformation right here. So anyway, he went uh, rook to C8. Oh, I went rook to C8. <laughs> And uh, he went rick to c1. Uh, right here, there's a little tactic. So rick to c1 was a slight mistake. Um, but anyway, uh, let's see if you can spot the tactic here. Okay, uh, pause the video if you want uh, some time to think about it. I'm going to give the answer away now. Um, well, the chess engine would start by exchanging first. I don't know if this is absolutely necessary, but maybe it simplifies things. But the real tactic is queen g4. So I move my queen out here, and it's attacking his bishop, and it's attacking this pawn, and the bishop can't move anywhere that defends that pawn. Um, so let's say he drops the bishop back here. I can just take. And uh, well, he can't. Um, I don't know. He he could he could try and get something out of it like this. He takes. I take. Rook here attacking my bishop, but I keep taking, and I just come out of this a pawn up no matter what he does so so interesting little tactic there uh anyway i didn't spot that i played b6 I, i'm still better though just because i have this uh, enduring advantage in the structure here and i'm just playing for that so let's go forward there's a lot of moves where we're kind of uh, shuffling a little bit i'm just kind of poking and pushing poking pushing and prodding trying to improve my position bit by bit and uh, now i've got the more active rick as well as pressure on the pawn so that's a slight improvement. Um, push my pawns forward and start to get my king into the game. And then um, let's see, he played bishop f4. So this actually is a big mistake and my next move where I just uh, avoided the trade and played bishop f8, that was a big mistake too. So you know when your opponent offers you these trades you've always got to evaluate them and see if uh, if they're worthwhile. So first of all uh, White. White could play something like a4. That would be a fine move here. Bishop f4 should lose. And, uh, and, and instead of retreating, I should just take that. And uh, in evaluating this exchange, you just have to look at all the ways that uh, white can take back. So if he takes back with the king, that's pretty simple. Just check. <laughs> and uh, you're just a pawn up. He has to move the king, and you can bring your rook back here keep pressure on these pawns or maybe grab another pawn over here. I don't know, his king can get active, but but now you're two pawns up. So that's that's good enough. Um, so say he takes with a pawn. Now he has the same number of pawns, but his pawn structure is kind of messed up. And his king is tied down defending this pawn and his rook is tied down defending this pawn. So you can slowly creep forward and take advantage of this. This is actually just a winning position for black with a good technique. And I you know, went over this with the chess engine to find, find the best way of uh, winning. So what you do is you creep forward with your king. He kind of shuffles his pieces a little bit. You get to this square where you're attacking his pawn. So now his king is defending two pawns and is, has no moves. Um, and notice the rick has no moves. <laughs> Uh, and then you can, uh, let's see, so you just played king c4, so he starts pushing his pawn, you push your pawns, and uh, well, we get some pawn moves here, but eventually, uh, eventually white runs out of pawn moves, and also, uh, you know, black has got his pawns all the way forward. And now here, if, um, if finally the rook moves away, or if he takes, well, if he takes, something similar will happen, uh, I'll grab this pawn. So let's look at this clever technique here. Uh, he pushes the pawn forward as a way to hold on to his material and uh, stop uh, <clears throat> stop me from making any for further progress. And now it seems like I'm I'm stymied as well. I, I can only go backwards here, but there's a clever uh, winning tactic here. Rick takes b2 because his king is over here defending these pawns. 
uh, up until the last moment. Uh, it's not over here where it can stop my pawns from queening. And so I sack the rook here and step forward with my king. And uh, I'm just going to win his rook over here. And then this pawn, he has to, white will have to sacrifice his rook to stop these pawns from queening. But then I'll, I'll queen the other pawn. So that's just a win for black. So let's go back to this position. So let's see, I played bishop h6 here. He played bishop f4, you know, in, in his mode of offering trades. Now this trade was absolutely losing, and there's another one that I should have taken him up on. But I was I was uh, feeling pretty good about my position anyway, and so I just kept, kept maneuvering, found another place to move my bishop. But I really should have stopped and calculated there and uh, realized that I was just winning there. So let's go forward after a bunch more shuffling here. We get to this uh, critical position where I've got his king cut off and so he can't really defend this pawn. But he played king g2, which is actually a good move here. And I was too quick to grab the pawn. Right here, if I grab the pawn, he could play, he should have played, I did grab the pawn, which was a mistake, and he should have played rook h1. Because after this, let's see, I can get in a check. Um, he moves the king back. I can drop my rook back to defend my bishop, but I'm kind of all tied up. So I, I can hold on to my extra pawn for a little bit, but uh, yeah, this this should probably be drawing. Whenever I move that bishop away, you can take this pawn and I can't I can't really make any progress from that position. So we've got bishop h4 was just too quick. Uh, it's an old rule that they uh, often say, an old saying, you should make progress slowly in the end game. So kind of inch by inch. And uh, this is another position where uh, Zugzwang can be applied. Uh, it turns out that uh, White's pieces don't have any good moves here, and I just need to kind of waste a move. So the move b5 is winning here. And so let's look at some examples. So if he just takes, I'll take back. And then my king will come forward and attack this pawn and win it. And, uh, and I should win from that point of view. Uh, so that, that's not a good idea. So he has to find some other move here after I push this pawn forward. Uh, but whatever he does uh, runs into some kind of trouble. Let's see, if he moves his king away, for example, he goes in this direction, I can bring my rook over here and then I can take that pawn without, uh, without my bishop getting trapped or attacked. So that doesn't work. And um, let's see, and if he moves his king the other direction, um, take the clear up the arrows, moves his king this direction, then the bishop can just grab the pawn right away because the rook can't come over and uh, attack attack the bishop because the king's in the way. So no king moves are any good here. He can't come forward to defend the pawn. If he goes backwards, he's in the way of the rook coming forward. If the rook goes up, then the king is in the way of the rook coming over and I can just grab the pawn again. So there's no king move, there's no rook move. If the rook moves away, I'll grab this pawn. And there's no bishop move, it turns out. So for example, uh, if the bishop goes here, then uh, maybe you spotted this one. I can take here. He goes here attacking my bishop. I can go here with check. <laughs> and after his king moves away, I can take his bishop. He takes mine, and then I can get my rook behind the pawn. So I'll have an end game with the extra rook and the rook behind the pawn. <laughs> Plus my king over on this side will... will uh, create another pawn on this side. So that's a winning end game too. Um, so how about any other move for the bishop? Well, anywhere else it goes, there's not too many squares, right? The king is attacking these two. The bishop has this one. Uh, so the remaining squares are here and here. Say it goes here. Then uh, I can still just grab the bishop because after this, I do the check, king moves away. I drop back and attack his bishop. And we get the same kind of trade. This is not as simple as the other one, but um, but I'm winning here with the, uh, he has to take some time to round up this pawn and these pawns are uh, breaking through. So, uh, so everything uh, wins there. <laughs> so you just have to kind of wait a move before taking that pawn. Uh, that's, that's hard to calculate in a blitz game, I have to admit. But in a, in a slow game, that's the kind of thing you can look for. Or if you have time on your clock and you think you might have a win there in the end game. That's that's the kind of thing you might want to look for. Pretty clever. Okay, so I took right away, and he didn't uh, he didn't uh, take advantage of this opportunity. He just pushed the pawn forward on the queen side, and after that, I'm just winning. 
and I play this part correctly. So if you saw this during the uh, the live game, I have no particular comments on this section. I'm just I'm just winning here, and I didn't make any big mistakes. So uh, eventually, he resigns after I get this pawn to a point where he can't uh, stop it from advancing. And as I pointed out in the game, uh, you know, he voluntarily kind of closed his bishop off. He put this bishop on this square and put those two pawns there to defend it. Well, he already had one pawn there and he brought the other one up to defend it. So it's a very solid, solidly defended piece. But those pawns are also in the way of the bishop uh, getting back into the game. So you always have to be very careful in playing something like that. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this and I will see you next time. Bye.